In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Last week, we preached and meditated on our Lord as he was crowned with thorns, as his king's kingship was mocked, and then we ended the scene with his condemnation to death by the unjust and cowardly Pontius Pilate. To the ocean of the torments which Christ suffers was finally to be added the bitter and ignominious death on the cross. The sentence of death, he is to be crucified. The sentence is not only pronounced by Pontius Pilate, but eternal Father, will you now forsake your eternal word? Will you permit your only begotten, well-beloved Son to undergo this terrible death? The Father in heaven answers, echoes the words of Pilate, yes, he is to be crucified. But why? Christ is innocent. And the Father answers, I have so much loved the world that I have given over my only begotten Son for its redemption. Let us turn to the angels. Angels, what do you say to this last unprecedented condemnation of your God and Creator? The answer of all the angels, he is to be crucified. But wherefore, why is he to be crucified? Of what evil has he been guilty? Of no evil whatever, but he must die, answer the angels, that the mansions in heaven, once the abode of those angels who are now burning in hell, the apostate, unfaithful angels, that their places may be peopled with men, ransomed by the precious blood that Christ will shed. But you, O Adam, can you find words wherewith to pronounce upon Christ the sentence? Adam says, he is also to be crucified. He must die on the wood that he may redeem the children thereon, my children whom I lost by the wood. The fruit of the tree of this wood is to be the fruit of life because I ate the fruit of the tree of death. And you, weeping most afflicted Mary, mother of Jesus, will you not raise your hands to heaven? Will not your powerful prayers penetrate the cloud to change the sentence? You have found grace with God. But no, that is not her prayer. She says again, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it, be it done unto me according to his word. And his word is that his son and my son should die for the sins of the world. He is to be crucified. But you, O Christian, you who have frequently defiled your soul by sin, give your verdict on the fate of your Savior. You must also cry out, he is to be crucified, for if he die not, I shall suffer eternal loss and eternal death. Say, he is to be crucified, but he shall be crucified forever also in my heart. He shall be fastened therein with three nails, that I may never <coughs> lose him again. And upon these three nails are the names, faith, hope, and charity. And so the sentence is passed. Not only the Jews cry out for his crucifixion, but it seems that all of creation and even the Creator himself, so that the wrath of God and the wrath of our sins is upon him, and the great weight and burden of all the sins is embodied in that wood, in the splintered and harsh, heavy and cruel wood of the cross, which is now assembled and brought before Christ, who is again clothed in his own garments to be led out of the city. 
Christ does not run away from the cross, does not complain, does not turn to impatience or curses, sees the cross and sees within its wood all of our sins and all of us, every creature that he was redeeming by his blood there, kneels down, embraces that cross, holds it tightly to his breasts, and kiss it in great love, accepting it with the utmost resignation to God's holy will. For this he was born into the world, for this he had come. Now is the time to fulfill the final moments of his life and his mission. With great courage, with great love for us, he willingly takes up the cross, takes up the condemnation laid upon him, takes upon his shoulder the wrath of God, the wickedness and the bitterness, the malice of all sin. The multitude accompany him to cast him out of the city, he the scapegoat upon whom all the sins of men were laid, an outcast of the people. There was a ceremony in the Old Testament of the scapegoat where the priest would lay his hands upon a goat to cast upon it the sins of the people and then it would be driven out of the city into the desert to be torn apart by wild beasts or to die of thirst and hunger. And that ceremony is also repeated at a holy mass when the priest puts his hands over the ablata, over the wine, and the host to be consecrated, laying the sins of the people upon scapegoat. But now the symbolisms are no more. This is the real scapegoat. This is Christ. The jeering mob lead him outside of the city, mocking, blaspheming him, a crowd of wicked boys surrounding him, soldiers walking to and from, as if he had been a great criminal. And yes, he is reputed among the criminals, for behind him are the two thieves, the two robbers, also carrying their crosses, but not with patience and love, but with grumblings, blasphemies, and curses. These are the streets of Jerusalem through which he had passed so many times, offering comfort to the poor, preaching the gospel to them, words of life, of hope, of love, raising up the lowly, forgiving the adulterous, healing the sick by the touch of his merciful and godly hands. And now the same mob seems to have entirely forgotten his love, his mercy, the miracles that he performed, the wonderful deeds among them, and they hurry him on to his death. What horrible ingratitude. What a terrible sin. Our Lord, already weakened by so much suffering and beatings from the night before, having lost so much blood, in the scourging and crowning with thorns, his strength fails him, and... He falls to the ground, exhausted, crushed by the heavy load of the cross. Not so much the physical weight, but the spiritual weight of all of our sins. No one pities him. No one sympathizes with him. His enemies are jubilant, and his friends have abandoned him and run away. There are some tears flowing, but they are no consolation. Weep not for me, he says to the women of Jerusalem, but for yourselves and for your children. For Christ foresaw what was to come upon this ungrateful and faithless city in the year 70 AD during the siege from the Romans, how much they would suffer in consequence of their terrible crime of deicide. He falls many times. And here, at last, there is one soul that loves him perfectly, one heart that feels for him, his holy and immaculate mother. And what a meeting that is. And yet, 
it is of little comfort, for their eyes meet each other and increases the pain, a bitter pain, for this mutual pain was to be measured by their mutual love. Each one sees the other suffering and only adds to their pains. The Jews see that Christ will not make it to Calvary, will die before he can be crucified. And so out of further cruelty, not out of kindness, they compel a stranger, Simon of Cyrene, to carry his cross after him. The soldiers force him at the point of a sword to take up this cross after a criminal and grudgingly, unwillingly at first, Simon takes up the cross. Yet in the company of Christ on the way to Calvary, he learns then in just a brief few moments how precious is the cross where it unites him to Christ. And the one he looked upon as a criminal condemned to death, he now acknowledges as his Savior, and it will be to his great honor in life and in eternity that he was able, he was privileged to physically carry that cross with our Lord, and to help our Lord. How often this is the case with us when a cross is imposed upon us, one that we cannot shake off, a sickness, financial difficulty, a death of a loved one. We at first unwillingly, begrudgingly have to suffer it. But as we learn by and by, it unites us to Christ. We learn to cherish and to love it because it brings us closer to Christ. It reminds us that we have deserved all suffering because of our own sins. And Christ gives us the opportunity to make up for these sins and the opportunity to accompany him, to carry the cross with him, to be partakers in the great work of redemption, to make satisfaction for our own sins and hopefully for the sins of others. As we meditate on the Via Crucis, we see all different kinds of souls, all different kinds of people. Those who hate him, the Pharisees, and the mob that cry out for his death. The indifferent ones who pass him by, who know him not, who care little whether he lives or dies. The holy women who weep over him, and Simon of Cyrene, who unwillingly carries the cross at first, but later learns to love it. The cross is the great polarizing factor, we might say, to divide the followers of Christ from his enemies, to divide those who are for him into those who are against him. We cannot embrace Christ and be close to him without also embracing the cross and loving the cross as he did for us. What shall we be on this way of the cross? We all have our own passion to suffer. <clears throat> How shall we bear our crosses? With murmurings, with, grum with grumblings, half-heartedly, impatiently, or do we learn to love them, our crosses, to embrace them, to even thank our Lord for giving us these crosses because they are for our own good. We know that God chastises the children whom he loves, and if everything in life is going well for us, easy, comfortable, it is then that we should be very much afraid, because if we have life too easy in this world, then we probably won't have it very easy in eternity. Contemplate your beloved Redeemer, crowned with thorns, being dragged on to his death, bearing that heavy cross upon his shoulder, as he cries out to the crowds, if any man wishes to follow me, 
Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and come after me. And again, his warning words, He that will not carry his cross cannot be my disciple and is not worthy of me. My dear faithful, let us not be afraid of the cross. Let us not be afraid of suffering. This is the lot of everyone in this world, but it is for the Christian also his glory, his means wherewith he is united to Christ. This procession finally makes its way to the summit of Calvary, where, urged on by malice and hate, the executioners complete the preparations for the consummation of the sentence. They tear off Christ's garments. At the scourging, Jesus was exposed naked to the soldiers, and now, here on Calvary, to the whole world to the pilgrims passing by who are going to the temple. What shame and confusion our Lord endured at this moment in his sensitive heart. How intense must have been his suffering, his anguish, when his clothes being torn off his wounds began to bleed again afresh. And thus he had to endure the vile gaze of that rabble. O oh, my people, what have I done? Whereby have I offended you? Out of love for you, I have struck Egypt with many plagues, but you have stricken me from the crown of my head to the sole of my foot. I delivered you from the oppression of Egypt, but you have delivered me over to my enemies. I have brought you out of the land of bondage, but you have dragged me out of Jerusalem to crucify me. I slew the firstborn of Egypt, and you are going to kill me. <clears throat> the only begotten Son of God. To save you from the fury of Pharaoh, I divided the Red Sea for you to pass through, but you have torn my body with scourges. I fed you with manna in the desert, and you give me vinegar and gall to drink in my thirst. On Mount Sinai, I gave you the law of life, and you pronounce the sentence of death upon me. I gave you Moses and Aaron as leaders, and you give me two malefactors as companions. Would to God that our Savior were not obliged to renew these complaints, but alas, their echo, these reproaches of Good Friday, repeats itself again and again throughout the corridors of time, throughout the annals of Christian history, of ungrateful people. From the Mount of Calvary, Christ cries out, Christian people, that the perfidious Jews should treat me thus was no marvel, but that you, you who by so many titles are my people, that you should prefer Barabbas to me, that you should betray me, that you should crucify me. Oh, this is the excess of in gratitude. O ye Christian people whom I love above all the rest that inhabit the earth, whom I have redeemed and fed with my blood, enriched with my graces, nourished with my flesh, in what have I offended you? Answer, if you can. Because I was bathed in my own blood in the garden of Gethsemane for love of you, you now daily betray me like Judas and crucify me with the Jews. Do we not see this now? The Judases in the high places in the church, in the very chair of Peter, who kiss with their lips Christ and then kiss the Koran, which blasphemes Christ and the Holy Trinity, who pretend to adore God and at the same time allow knees to be bowed before idols in the very Garden of the Vatican, who indeed betray Christ with their lips, speaking heresy, blasphemies, sacrileges, and all of those terrible sins against the virtue of faith. May we never be like Judas. 
May we never betray Christ and choose sin over him. For every time that we choose sin, then we choose Barabbas and we crucify Christ. We choose a murderer and a vile criminal over the Son of God, O Holy. Let us resolve then to know the malice of sin and to know the great love of Christ for us. We see this in his passion. We see this in his carrying of the cross. On one hand, his immense eternal love for us. On the other hand, the vile wickedness, ingratitude, and malice of sin that chooses the ugly and horrible things and seeks to kill God. We see the great love of Christ enduring all these things for us. And so as Christians with the name Christ, Christians, anointed ones, followers of Christ, we also have to follow him on the way of Calvary. Let us resolve then to patiently bear without complaining all our crosses, all the trials and sufferings that must come our way. Let us learn to appreciate, to love, and even to cherish our crosses because they unite us to Jesus. They make us more like him. And those crosses then will lead us on the straight and narrow way which leads to eternal life. Let us walk on this royal way of the road, not enjoying the comforts to excess in this world, but that we may enjoy the eternal comforts and eternal rest of the followers of Christ who enjoy that in the bliss of his kingdom in heaven. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.